Hey everybody, welcome back to Photorec.tv. I'm Toby and I've got some answers for you. A couple of weeks ago, I asked you to send in your camera, photography, composition, gear questions. You did. You sent in a lot of fantastic questions. And in part one, which is up on my channel and linked down below, I spent 38 minutes answering your great questions, but I didn't get to all of them. So today, we're gonna get to a few more. We've got great questions to cover today what to look for when you're buying a new tripod. I also wanna talk a little bit about simplifying your lenses and the best gear for time-lapse landscape photography, plus a few more bonus questions thrown in. Let's get started. This video is brought to you by Squarespace. I run photorec.tv and my own personal portfolio site on Squarespace because it's so easy, it looks beautiful, and there is great peace of mind. I know that it all works. And if for any reason it doesn't, there is 24 seven tech support. They offer a fantastic 14 day free trial, no credit card required. All you gotta do is give them your email address. There's no strings attached and you get to build a site out for 14 days. A little later in this video, I'm gonna show you just how easy it is. But if you start at squarespace.com slash TV, you can save 10% off when you do go to purchase. Thanks. Question number one. What do I recommend for landscape time-lapse photography? This is from Chris. Chris, this is a great question. I, want, I love uh, an excuse to talk a little bit about time-lapse photography. I don't talk about it enough on this channel. First off, of, of course I'm a lover of all things photography. I've built a living and a career around photography and talking about it. And the impact that you can make when you capture one beautiful scene in one frame, it's awesome. But the things that you can notice and see when you create a time-lapse, and just to make sure we're all on the same page, a time-lapse, of course, is when you go out and you capture many frames and then play them back in even quicker succession. So it's, it's speeding up time. And when you do that, you start to notice things, as I said, that you do, wouldn't normally walking around enjoying the world unless you sat very patiently. And how often do so many of us do that these days? I'm showing these, this example, uh, one of my favorite time lapses that I captured in Yosemite National Park, but then I've got other ones of just people going by. Uh, so time lapse is a lot of fun. What gear do you need? You need a camera, to be obvious, and you need a lens. We'll get to lenses in a second. Now, the good news is today, many, many cameras have built into them a mechanism that allows you to set it up so that it will automatically take a picture every X number of seconds. That's great. I mean, that's really all you need to do. Tell it to take a picture every two seconds or three seconds. It depends a lot on your subject. And you really, Chris, just asked about gear. So I'm gonna try to not talk too much about the other parts of it, but those get me really excited as well. Um, if you have a camera that does not have that, I mean, honestly, you could set a timer and that reminds you to push the shutter button every two to three to four seconds. That's not optimal, but you could do it. Your other option is if the camera doesn't have any uh, built-in mechanism to take a picture every X number of seconds is to pick up something like this. These are cheap, they're on Amazon. They run, when I say cheap, I'm talking 20 to $30. They're called an intervalometer. Uh, this one runs off AAA batteries, uh, and you can set it up to do the exact same thing that many of the cameras have now internally. That is to say, take a picture every X number of seconds, two, three, four, five. This is capable of controlling the length of the exposure too, if you wanted to do long exposure time lapses. You wanna get a little bit more adventurous, have a little bit more control, uh, something like the little MyOps trigger. This is basically a Bluetooth version of this. Uh, and your phone can talk to this little device and you can set up and punch in your kind of uh, values that you want. You also can, in some of these, adjust those values over the course of the uh, exposure or the course of the time lapse, which is kind of a really cool thing too, to be able to change that, especially change it some for the conditions. But let's come back to the camera and talk about a lens. Now you asked specifically about landscape time lapse photography. Landscapes can be shot with anything, I think, focal length wise from, gosh, 16 to 400. It really depends on what you want to do. So a, you know, a nice good 24 to 70 is great. But I wanna really put in people's minds that this is when manual lenses shine. When I mean manual lenses, I'm not talking just manual focus, I'm also talking manual aperture. So this lens from Nissi, 
I adjust the aperture on the lens. Why? Why are these so much better for time-lapse photographies? Well, a quick camera lesson for many cameras. When you go to take a picture, you set your aperture, your shutter speed and all of that, but we're talking about aperture. And when you go to take the picture, the aperture closes down to that value. You take the picture, shutter happens, the shutter opens, the aperture opens back up on many cameras. It's less common on mirrorless these days, but on DSLRs, that is typically how it works. So every time you take a picture, that aperture mechanism is shutting down to whatever stop you've specified. Let's say you've picked F8. F8 is great. F8, 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 picture after picture after picture, and many time lapses are thousands of pictures. That's in a perfect world, but you know what? You don't get F8 every time. Nope. You get maybe F7.95 one time, and then maybe F8.001 another time. Why am I telling you this? Why does it matter? Because those minute differences in the actual aperture value while you're shooting change the exposure just very tiny, tinily, just very slightly is what I'm trying to say. And what happens when these images are played back in rapid succession is you can see some flickering as that exposure changes just a little bit. You say, why haven't I ever noticed this before? Because you are not usually taking a thousand pictures of a very static subject without a whole lot changing going on. And even in some situations, you wouldn't notice it if you did, because there's so many other variables, like the sun's coming out from the clouds and this or that's happening. So, but when you are shooting a time lapse and you really want it to be nailed, shot to shot to shot, a full manual lens is nice. You do want, and we'll talk more about this in a minute, a sturdy tripod uh, that is steadying the camera. You don't want any kind of wiggling because any other, remember I said that exposure change just a little bit is going to impact your frame. Any kind of movement from shot to shot is going to impact your frame as well. So you want a sturdy tripod. And then you can get fancy. As I said, I love time lapses. I've dabbled a little bit with devices that allow you to have some motion during the course of the time lapse where you put the camera on this and over the course of the time lapse it rotates to give your field of view difference. This one is from Syrup. I've got uh, the Move Shoot Move rotator here which is mostly a star tracker but it also does have a, a kind of time lapse motion device built into it as well. Those can be interesting. Um, and then there's very fancy things like the Rhino sliders or Syrup has a slider as well that allow you to kind of lift the camera and move it from point A to point B over the course of a time lapse. But again, if you pick a very interesting uh, location with dynamic elements in it, I think you're totally fine to not have uh, all of this moving stuff. And I said I wasn't going to get into the kind of composition-y and, you know, kind of philosophical side of shooting time lapses. But I will say that it is really important to take some time to set up that composition because it's happened to me where I've rolled up to a scene and there's epic clouds happening or maybe aurora and I've rushed to set up a time lapse. And so often after the fact, I look at it and sure what's happening in the sky is interesting, but I set up such a crappy composition, like there's a couple of bushes in the foreground that are just kept wiggling in the wind and blowing, or it's a little bit of crooked, um, or something's peeking in in the, one of the corners of the frame, that it actually impacts dramatically enough in a negative way the cool stuff happening that it really wasn't worth shooting. So take the time to really think about that composition. And if there's gonna be movement through that composition over the course of the time lapse, like is the sun going to appear in the frame or the moon gonna rise, then you wanna keep that, those developments in mind as you set up. Thanks for that question, Chris. I like talking about it. I hope to come back and talk some more about landscape in the future. Now I wanna take a moment and show you just how easy it is to build a website in Squarespace. Let's have some fun. We're going to build a sweet little website with Squarespace in this advertisement. I'm going to show you just how easy it is. Of course, you want to start at squarespace.com slash TV so that you can save 10%. We're going to jump right in. Right now, we're looking at the photography templates, but there are templates for all different businesses. I love this clean Nevin style template. And when you land here, you've got a little assistant sitting off on the right. It actually is sitting here ready to guide you through every single step you need to customize this website and make it your own. But I'm here to hold your hand. Now the Nevins template comes with a work portfolio and within that you have galleries. Squarespace calls them projects, same, same. We have also have a blog page and a contact page and in this ad we're going to make all of these ours. So let's go. 
We're gonna dive into that portfolio page. Here's a list of all of the projects. I only need three. So I'm gonna delete those demo ones using the little dots on the side. And one of them, I'm gonna rename to people and update the URL. Double click text to edit and type your own. Now let's get our photos in here. So I'm gonna click that little image, select the existing images and delete them. And we have arrived at the hardest part of the whole website building. And it has nothing to do with Squarespace. This is where you need to pick your favorite images to share with the world. I've already done that. So I'm just gonna drag and drop them from their folder right on here. Oh, they look beautiful. Oh, oh, hold on, we need a better way to display some of these. The cropping's not quite working out. We're gonna hit that little edit button. Look at all of our options. We can change the aspect ratio. I like a nice square, clean looking gallery. You can add a bunch of columns too. Two columns, three columns, four columns. I think three is good here. I'm gonna repeat this process with my other two galleries or projects. And I'm using the People Gallery now to show you a fantastic little tool that Squarespace provides. You see, I love these nice, clean, square thumbnails, but they don't work great for portraits. So the Image Focal Point tool makes sure that your thumbnails are centered on your subject even when you have a square crop. Thank you, Squarespace, for thinking us photographers. Got a mobile tool here, which allows you to see exactly what this is gonna look like on a mobile device. Let's move on to the contact page. Again, a double click, and I'm editing that contact information, putting in my information, and this is where I wanna add a form, because a form looks pro. Say it with me, pro. Squarespace makes it so easy. One click, I've got a form. The default settings on the storage tab is for the contents of this form, when completed, is going to end up in my inbox. It makes it so easy so that I can reply to my eager customers and visitors. Let's move on to the blog. So you got a couple of different options with these demo posts. You can delete them, obviously, or you can just put them in draft mode. This is where you create a new blog post, add a little bit of content, video, pictures, all of that can go in this blog post. And you can even actually just publish it right now or schedule it for some point in the future. I wanna move down to the footer where it's got social media links. I wanna make sure those are mine. I'm gonna edit that with just a single click and put in my information. I don't wanna to link to Facebook. I wanna to link to another website. So I'm just gonna add that and automatically it switches out the icon for me to a cool little link icon. And hey, this is my site, so I can remove the Made with Squarespace if I want. Now I need to update each of the images used to showcase the gallery thumbnails for the galleries themselves. So I'm gonna take a moment to do that. And here we go, a beautiful website. I can easily connect a domain within Squarespace. You just buy it and boom, it's connected. It really is that simple. And of course, if you decide to take this website further, those tools are there. You've got e-commerce options for selling merch, for selling your prints. If you wanna book clients through the scheduler, you've got that tool available to you. And of course, analytics to see which of your pages are really grabbing people's attention. Squarespace truly is an all-in-one platform and you can try them out for free for 14 days starting at squarespace.com slash TV. Thanks, Squarespace. This is coming to us from Malcolm. He had a circular polarizer filter on his 200 to 600 lens on a Sony A9. He was trying to shoot through a window with that circular polarizer lens on, circular polarizer filter on his lens, and he could not get it to focus. Why? All right. First off, let's make sure we're all on the same page about circular polarizers. Circular polarizers are really cool filters. I just wrote a very long article for the uh, community that I run with David and Allie McKay. Um, you can learn more about that at photorec.tv slash pen. Circular polarizers change the way light enters your camera. Uh, and they do stuff that no post-processing can do. They can literally remove reflections from shiny objects. They can remove glare or reflection from a window. They can actually make it vanish so that that window becomes very clear and see-through. I don't want to get in the science of how they do that because then I'll look like an idiot because I don't really uh, understand it so well. But they are polarized glass that affects the way the light rays actually enter and you rotate them to change that. You often can use these to shoot right through a window. Aquariums is another great place. It's glass that you're trying to shoot through and remove reflections. Now, they also block a little bit of light. They have, you know, they are darker and uh, the way they work, they often, as a secondary impact, block a little bit of light. So in a lower light situation, cameras can struggle to focus. Now you're working with an A9 and a 200-600. This is a, a very nice combination. I don't expect that that lower light was the issue there. So the other thing that I think, and I don't know, but I think more and more windows these days are being made slightly polarized because they, um, I don't know, look nicer, are better for energy efficiency, I, I don't know. But I'm noticing that when I wear polarized sunglasses, more often than not, when I'm looking around, 
the, some car windows, some store windows, they have kind of a weird pattern to them. And that means that they too are polarized to some degree. So I think if the window is polarized and your filter is polarized and there was some kind of butting heads going on there that was causing an issue. One final thought might have nothing to do with the polarization. You might not have been giving the camera a, a high enough contrast spot to focus on. It might have been really dim inside the window or very uh, bright and uh, kind of low contrast scene outside the window. So there's always that chance as well. I don't know, follow up Malcolm. I'd love to chat a little bit more about that and see if we can figure it out. All right, now we've got a question from Chris. He's got a Nikon D850. He just bought the Sigma 150 to 600 sport lens. That's a good sized lens combined with the D850. And he says it looks huge on top of the tripod that he had for a previous camera that happened to be a good bit smaller. That tripod is the ProMaster XC528. It has a little ball head that he's not so happy about. This is a long question, by the way. When he's watching a subject in the rear screen, when he has this combination on top of that ProMaster, he notices that it takes a long time to settle down. So it's set, it's set on the tripod. He's looking through the viewfinder, the LCD on the back of the camera, and he notices that there's vibration long after he stops touching the camera. That is a sure sign, Chris, as you're asking, that that tripod is not well suited for that combination. It might not be well suited for any combination. I'm not a huge fan of ProMaster, but let's move on. All right. Uh, he also doesn't love how you uh, uh, extend the legs. They're twist knuckles, the rubber grip seems to spin and all kind of seems a little slow to go from full compact to full height. He would love to have a tripod that is easy to go from uh, low down to full height. Also, we'll be able to spread the legs further out to be really stable. And he likes to hike 14ers. For anybody not familiar with 14ers, the idea is a mountain that is 14,000 feet or higher. Colorado's got lots of them. You hike them. Yeah, that's a lot of hiking, a lot of uphill hiking. So you probably don't. Something like this is very, very stable but weighs about six pounds and it doesn't even have a head on it. So this is probably not the tripod you want for hiking 14ers. So he's asking, um, what should he look for in a new tripod? And specifically, is carbon fiber all that it's cracked up to be? Now, is that a pun that I didn't intend to make? Um, or there's something else. And also he asked about gimbals. He's heard that mentioned and fluid head. So sorry for the long question. Thanks, Chris. Chris, that's all right. That's a great question because there's a lot to unpack in there. First off, let's talk. I think you have two basic choices when, no, you've got three basic choices when choosing a tripod. Uh, the first is whether or not you want Arca Swiss or Manfrotto head. I'm a huge fan of Arca Swiss. Seems like all my friends have Arca Swiss, all the cool kids. And it's just the type of plate that it takes up here. So many attachments. I'm a big fan of the spider holster system. They use Arca Swiss, even though they're not specifically a tripod company. Um, and Peak Design, I don't love their tripod, but I love their tripod plates, and they're all Arca Swiss. That's your first choice. I think you should go with Arca Swiss. Your second choice is carbon fiber or aluminum, and that really comes down to price. That's the only difference in my mind. Um, are you willing to spend more to get a lighter tripod from carbon fiber? Uh, I say only price because I have no issues at all. Carbon fiber, just as sturdy, just as robust as aluminum. I have um, no issues at all recommending carbon fiber if you can pay a little bit more for them. For the same kind of strength and sturdiness, uh, it is um, lighter and it costs more money. Uh, one benefit, I think, of carbon fiber over aluminum is it actually is a little bit nicer to handle in colder weather. It doesn't get as cold. Then you have to decide what kind of head that you want. So yes, Arca Swiss is the plate, but you've got a lot of different options. Most photographers choose a ball head. That one looks a little funny. Let me, let me choose this one right here. Um, and it's simple with a knob to release the tension on the ball. You manipulate it around, find that spot that perfects your composition and tighten it. This one also has a panning knob so it can pan down at the bottom. 
other tripods might have three knobs on them. This is for the ball itself. This is the panning one right here. And then you've got this stupid one. I think it's stupid. That's why I put tape over it to remind myself never to accidentally touch it or grab it in the dark. This controls how much tension is involved, how much you have to unscrew the main knob for the ball head. It's a tensioner, that's all it is. Um, those are things to think about. I think simpler is better. This is a Mifoto carbon fiber. I can't actually remember if it's the Globe Trotter or the Road, oh, it tells me right here, it's the Road Trip. This has gone with me everywhere for about the past five years, almost everywhere. And it is an easy recommendation. Uh, this is a nice balance of weight to um, sturdiness and height. So I'm very happy to recommend this to anybody looking for a decent all-around tripod. There are better ones out there. You can pay more and get a little bit of a lighter weight. Um, but I think this is a great middle-of-the-road tripod that I don't mind carrying up a mountain and I know is going to get high enough for whatever my shot is needed and also holds my gear in a nice sturdy fashion. Now, I've experimented with a few other tripods. I reviewed that Peak Design a little while ago that I talked about. Um, I'm not a big fan of that, but during that time, I tried another brand, a Leo Photo, that actually is being, using, is being used to hold up the camera that I'm talking to right now. Uh, I just bring that up because, I mean, one of the reasons why it's easy to recommend the Mi Photo is, is if you do have anything that goes wrong, you can call the company. And I've had replacement leg before because I lost the leg. It actually fell off. That was my fault, snowmobiling. Apparently, after you go off over enough bumps, it can unscrew after a long day and fall off somewhere in the Idaho wilderness. Um, and I got somebody on the phone and, the, and paid $18 for them to send me a new leg, and hey, everything was happy after that. So you go on Amazon and you see so many of these carbon fiber tripods with brand names I don't know and don't recognize. Um, and I don't trust that if something goes wrong, you're going to be able to... Uh, get parts or get it fixed ever. So that's something to keep in mind. But the Leo Photo, I'm using that one uh, under that camera. And then this giant one that Chris, you mentioned, you saw on the back of the van in Zion. Um, and I am very, very happy with these. So that's another brand that I can recommend and, and talk to you a little bit about. Now, you asked two other things that we got to cover. One is, well, let's, let's bring up this little Mi Photo. This is another Mi Photo. This is aluminum. I don't necessarily recommend this unless you're trying to go really light because the center column is always stuck up and that doesn't feel as super stable to me. But I've now had this tripod for coming up on almost a decade and it's still in good shape. Uh, so you mentioned um, being a little slow to set up. So this is another style of tripod that you have to decide between. Do you want twist lock or flip lock? So this is twist. You twist these. I grabbed all of them at once and then you can pull them out like so, voila. And then you go back, quarter turn, twist. I've always been a fan of the twist lock for the most part because uh, they just it feels clean and fairly easy uh, and it doesn't feel like anything can really break in this kind of situation. And it's, it's pretty fast to you know, set up as a whole. You just work your way back up and then you plunk it down. However, what happens to me sometimes and actually has happened to my good friend Steve, some tripods as they get older, <laughs> yeah, uh, you have trouble getting these snug enough, or you don't just quite notice, and when you go put it down, it starts to drift a little. And then you gotta figure out which one, did I not tighten it all the way? Or sometimes it just resists tightening all of the way. So that is a downside to that, that visually you can't tell if you've nailed it until you put the tripod down on the ground, and put a little weight on it. I always push on the tripod before I put the camera on it um, to see if it is all locked in place. Your other option for the legs are these flip lock. And you flip these little locks up and of course slide, flip them down, they're locked in place. You can do all of them at once too, of course, and then work your way back up the tripod like that. I, this is the only flip lock I own. It usually sits underneath my camera uh, in the studio. 
I, I don't know. I've always felt like this doesn't feel as clean to me. It's gonna get snagged coming in and out of my bag or in and out of the side pocket a little bit more often. But the benefit is that yes, very, very visually, you can immediately tell whether or not you've got the legs completely closed or completely open. So it's something to keep in mind. This tripod is out also though, because you asked about fluid head. This is a fluid head tripod. Typically, fluid head tripods are reserved for video because you can put a camera on here uh, and it takes your jittery coffee-fueled, point to my coffee cup over there, coffee-fueled jitters and uh, translates them or, or dampens them by the fluid that is actually inside this head. They're not typically used for photography. They can be. I do know some photographers that like to use them, but you can get a nice balance here and then you know, when you let go, it just kind of resets to a horizontal position like that. But usually the movement of the head, this really only goes up or down or left or right. It does have a way to half balance. But again, that's kind of set up for video where you get it level, even if the legs aren't level. And then that's where you can pan left or right without having to worry about going off at a cockeyed angle. So not typically what you want for photography. Typically what you want for photography is a standard little ball head. You mentioned gimbals as well. Gimbals are great for bigger lenses. You might want to consider it if you're really trying to follow uh, wildlife. I've never used one extensively, not a serious wildlife photographer enough, but uh, on trips where some of our clients have been, um, they're pretty sweet and they allow you very easy motion while still supporting your camera as you track birds in flight or other faster moving wildlife. That's really where a gimbal excels. And then finally, uh, you know, you, I just, just wanna put this out there, you can buy a head separate from legs, but I come back to that me photo being just a good all around tripod. If you wanted to get fancier, a pair of carbon fiber legs from Faisal, paired with a really right stuff BH30 ball head. It's not cheap, but that is one of the sweetest combinations for size, weight, and performance out there if you wanted to get a little fancier. All right, great question. I hope that answer helps you. We've got Chad asking, who's more art VTC on Instagram. Landscapes are my main style. I currently have a Sony camera. I've got the 70 to 200 F4. The Tamron 17 to 28 f2.8, the Sony 55 f1.8, the Sony 200 to 600 G. I want to lighten the travel weight and buy a Sony 24 to 105 f4 and the Sony 100 to 400 GM. And then I'm going to sell the 70 to 200, the 200 to 600. And I'd like your opinion on whether the Sony 24 to 105 f4 is sufficiently sharp corner to corner for professional quality landscapes for printing or do I think the Tamron 28-75 f2.8 would be better? If you think there's a sharper value lens, please advise. Thanks heaps and keep up the good work. Chad, good question. Hey, I happen to have the 28-75 to f2.8 lens right here on my Sony. And often, I wish that I'd bought the 24-105 to f4. So first question that I wanna uh, answer is, or first I wanna say this out there, so often I hear from people jumping into mirrorless, that weight really was a factor in going with mirrorless. And I think Sony's done a really nice job of keeping the body weight down. And then third-party lens manufacturers like Tamron have done a really nice job of providing excellent lightweight lenses. That said, you asked specifically about the 24 to 105 from Sony. It is a fantastic lens. It blew me away when I shot with it, just how sharp it is from corner to corner. And it absolutely would be a fantastic lens for serious landscape photographers. And that is a great range. In the old days, the 24 to 105, you know, Canon, I think, may have been the first to kind of pioneer that range. It was a very convenient lens. It wasn't the sharpest lens. But Sony, and now the RF version from Canon as well, they are fantastic lenses. I have absolutely no reservation in recommending them or people using them as serious photography. Why? Do I wish I got the 24 to 105 over the 28 to 75? Honestly, that range from 24 to 28 is a nice range in a lot of landscape. And also having a little bit more at the telephoto end as well. And the fact that I just rarely use F2.8 in here. 
and honestly up at about 80 at f4 if if i need to take pictures or something like that that would be great for portraiture or separation from background for for a lot of subjects as well so i am happy with the tamron i'm not displeased with it um, its price is a lot better than the 24 to 105 so that's what i remind myself when i say gosh should i have gotten the 24 to 105 so I think this plan is great. 24 to 105, the 100 to 400, you have a fantastic travel combo in there. We're gonna wrap that up here because I think that's long enough for this video. That's two videos now equaling almost over, well, yeah, over an hour long. If you'd like to thank me for my time, a quick thumbs up is appreciated. If you're watching this and you're not a subscriber and you say, hey, I like this guy, you could hit that subscribe button along with clicking the little bell. So you'll be notified of future videos and then you'll come back and watch them and say, I like this guy, he's great. I don't like this guy and you unsubscribe. And just a reminder that the video was brought to you by Squarespace. I really appreciate their sponsorship of these videos. And if you really appreciated what I just did for you all, you should check them out. I mean, it benefits both of us. Squarespace is fantastic all in one platform. Try them out for free for 14 days at squarespace.com slash photorec TV. And as always, if you watch this and you have some suggestions, a better answer, an alternative answer, leave those in the comments right down below. There were some fantastic uh, second opinions on my last video and I really appreciated those. Thank you for sharing them. Thank you for watching. Bye-bye.